And you are on the platform. We uh, forewent the weather today because there was going to have to be musical chairs in the studio as our next guest has joined us. And it's very nice to have guests uh, face-to-face in the studio. Our next guest is sitting right next to me. And if you're, you're going to go back and re-watch this on the app or the podcast, you'll see him in all his uh, glory. He's a rather good-looking young man. Um, his name his name is Jacob Michingama, and he is a free speech advocate and expert from Copenhagen. And he's been brought here by um, an organisation that features on the platform regularly, the Free Speech Union. And boy, we've had massive response to it. He had Jonathan Ayling's uh, discussions with me, uh, tens of thousands, I think 58 or 59,000 for one of our uh, recent chats with Jonathan. And the Free Speech Union uh, promotes and protects the idea of free speech here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, our small and at times struggling uh, democracy. They're having their AGM, is it, uh, Jonathan? They're having their AGM, so they've invited uh, Jake about here um, to flap his guns and be the celebrity speaker. Jacob, welcome to New Zealand and and welcome to the platform. Thank you so much. Um, What do you do, I guess, is the broad, (laughs) open-ended question I start. We call you a free speech advocate or expert. What does that involve? Well, I run a think tank that is based in in Copenhagen, and I direct our future free speech project, which is uh, uh, focused on what we want to foster a global culture of free speech, and it's in cooperation with Columbia Universities and uh, and others. And uh, I think one of the, the main reasons why I'm here is that I recently published a book called Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, which tries to chart the history of uh, of free speech since its earliest days and and why we may actually benefit uh, from understanding the past when it comes to to the present and the future indeed. All right. How, to your mind, how important is free speech for every person on the planet, for, for humanity? Well, it depends. If you like to live in an authoritarian dictatorship, then free speech is not very important. You, you How many people <laughs> like to live in an authoritarian well, dictatorship when it comes uh, down to it? Well, uh, probably more than, than, uh, than, than you and I are comfortable with. But, but you know, if we assume that it, it comes to democracies, open uh, democracies, then, then free speech is actually the most important uh, right. Without free speech... Uh, democracy is not possible, nor is uh, respect for uh, individual freedom, dignity. Uh, and uh, in many ways, I think um, something which is misunderstood in, in much of the discourse today, I also think that free speech in many ways is uh, extremely important for marginalized groups and, and minorities, uh, which is why it's ironic that so many well-intentioned attempts to limit free speech are purportedly to, to protect... To mo- those groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you were look, to look back over the history of, of humanity, what was the high point for free speech <laughs> or are we at it? Well, I think, you know... <coughs> In a, in a certain sense, you could say that we're living in a golden age. You know, uh, we have internet. You could you could have uh, a guest on from anywhere in the world, uh, and 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 you know you can spread ideas across frontiers in ways that no one could have imagined. Uh, you know, even fifty or hundred years ago. But I would say that 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 the golden age is in decline. Uh, so I think that ten or fifteen years ago, many people thought that the digital age would basically make censorship obsolete and it would usher in a new golden era of, of, of freedom and democracy. But of course, in many ways, free speech has been reverse engineered by authoritarian states. China is a good example, but, but many others. But also, I think there's what I, what I call elite panic. So many leaders of democracies um, have become frightened about the potential of, of free speech, and this is something you must that meet the prime minister. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and you know this is something that we see recurring throughout history. Whenever the public sphere is democratized, when it's opened up to previously marginalized or silenced groups, those who are the institutional gatekeepers uh, fear the effects because uh, of, of allowing the unwashed mob a, a voice in, in public affairs. And th- this is something that we've seen, you know, with the printing press. Uh, with radio, with with telegram, uh, and 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 so on, and of course the digital age uh, is 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 that on steroids. Yeah, we are having very much in this country 
a debate over freedom of speech. And we have a Justice Minister who has announced that we will have new hate speech laws, I call yeah. them free speech repression laws, um, before September of next year, uh, if, if the timeline is to be believed. We have a Prime Minister who has launched a thing in conjunction with other world leaders called the Christchurch Call, a rather misguided reaction to, to a terrible massacre perpetrated by a lone gunman who was, uh, I think, mentally unstable. Um, that Christchurch Call initiative is being run in coordination with some of the biggest social media uh, corporates in the world and other world governments. And it would seem to be a desire to control the internet, to control the way people talk to each other and what they say um, on the internet. Is that a trend that is common in other parts of the world? Is this a debate that has been have, had in other Western democracies? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, so the Christchurch call... Um is, is, is not legally binding as such. It's, it's you know, governments coming together. And of, of course, it's a way to put pressure on, on, on big tech platforms to remove uh, extremist and, uh, and violent content. But in the European Union, uh, very recently, uh, something called the Digital Services Act was uh, announced. And that basically obliges uh, platforms to remove illegal content within short uh, timeframes. Uh, so if something is illegal in uh, in one of the member states of the European Union or under European Union law, mm. and uh, a platform is notified by it, either by a user or by a uh, authorities, then they have to remove it if they if they if they deem it uh, illegal. And of course, you know what is illegal can be very different. You know, in, in Hungary it might be LGBT content. In uh, in France uh, or Germany it it might be very broad categories of. Of hate speech, mm. so so I, I and and what we my organization has done is look at Germany was the first to pioneer these kinds of laws. Mm. So if, if in Germany uh, they passed a law saying that if big um, social media companies don't remove illegal content within 24 hours, they would face fines of up to 50 million euros. And what we saw within a couple of years was that countries like Turkey, Russia, Belarus, Venezuela copy-pasted <laughs> this democratic precedent. Of course, they did it in bad faith. They didn't have the same sort of uh, rule of law guarantees that they do in Germany, but it basically means that democracies are sort of forging the change with which authoritarian states can bind their own dissidents, mm. uh, which I think is a very worrying um, precedent and, and trajectory for online free speech. Mm. The debate here seems to have centred around the creation of a fear around something described as disinformation. Uh, my old parlance is lies. Uh, people who spread lies online or untruths online. Disinformation seems to me to be an academic's uh, poncy way of saying lies, people who spread lies. And we have, uh, believe it or not, though it's very hard to get um, accurate information about who funds it, we have a group called the Disinformation Project, which feeds into our security apparatus and is aligned with the Prime Minister's office, uh, actively engaged in mainstream media in claiming, in claiming that there is a massive conspiracy around the world of disinformation to turn people into Nazis, essentially. Um, they have huge credibility in mainstream media here. Is there, do you agree with their premise, and there was a documentary we're going to talk about on the programme later uh, this morning, do you agree with the premise that the internet is being used by bad faith actors who are coordinated in some way to drag people in politics to the right and create some new Nazi utopia? Because to be honest, that's the, that's yeah. the big conspiracy that's being sold by these government-supported agencies in New Zealand. Look, I, th I think there are lots of people spreading disinformation, not just on the right. I think that has been true... Uh, also, before the age of 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 the of the internet, you can do it with a printing press, yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, you know, I, yeah. There's a great book called Active Measures uh, from from 2020, which charts the history of disinformation, both how the CIA and the KGB became specialized, and and there are you wouldn't believe how many times, even big legacy outlets like the Washington Post and New York Times fell for a propaganda, for instance, by, by, by the KGB. So, so this is certainly nothing new. But I also agree, actually, that disinformation can lead to harms. I don't think you would have had an attack on the Capitol on January 6th without social media spreading insane conspiracy theories by, by Donald Trump and his, and his supporters. But, but 
But I think that in many ways, very often, disinformation and misinformation is not defined very clearly. So it, you know, it sometimes becomes something that we don't like, that we don't uh, agree with. And also the share of disinformation and hate speech online is very often exaggerated. So we've done some studies which suggest that the, num that, that the amount of illegal content on, on Facebook, for instance, is much smaller than the narrative that is driving some of these initiatives. And that's so interesting. In this documentary last night, we had a researcher saying, oh, 350,000 New, Zealand uh, New Zealanders accessed or were exposed to this terrible piece of disinformation. Well, that may well be, but we don't know that 350,000 people believed it exactly. or bought onto yeah. it, into it. And in fact, our security services say in New Zealand, there are maybe 750 for example, white supremacist extremists that they have any interest in, and, and of that number, only yeah. 50 of them really are a serious and, concern. And, and, and this boils down to something which is, uh, of course, extremely relevant in a democracy, because in a democracy, you know, we, we, have, we put trust in, in the, the individual citizen to, to vote based on, you know, uh, their opinions. And so if we don't trust that ordinary citizens can, you know, a critical mass, at least, of citizens can distinguish between truth and lies, mm. uh, then, you know, the whole basis of democracy basically falls away. That sort of a more elitist free speech uh, orientation where you need specially appointed mm. gatekeepers to sort of filter through information so that the unwashed mob can make informed choices. And that, I think, is a, is a dangerous well, sometimes concept. they don't make informed choices. Of course. Sometimes we don't. But, and, but, but that's but, human but, nature. But, of course. And sometimes, you know, what we think is an informed choice at one point in time looks less informed 10 or 20 years uh, later. And, and the only way that we sort of can get to that is through discussion and, and, and investigation of our mm. preconceived ideas. I, I think, you know, looking back at our current era, uh, 50 years from now, there are probably a lot of things that we take for granted that uh, future generations are going to get, oh my God, how, why did they do that? Why did they try to solve this problem in that way? Or why did they uh, ho have these beliefs? And you know, it might be you and I who are, who are, who are wrong about uh, certain ideas, but it might be also be, 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 be others. And maybe most of us are wrong about certain ideas. Yeah. Can you give me an instance where hate speech laws in the broadest terms, have worked? Well, I think that's, uh, it's very, very difficult to sort of, you know, how do you, how do, how do you investigate whether they work or not? What I, in my book, I use Weimar Republic, Germany, uh, the collapse of, of, of German democracy and, and uh, the Third Reich, the establishment of the Third Reich. That, that is very often used in Europe to, to argue for why we need hate speech laws, because if mm. only the Nazis had been suppressed uh, more, then but you, the Nazis passed their own laws, which created. I've just. I've got a no, son that, studying law. Yeah, no, He's they, been they, looking at what they did to lawyers. Well, you had to be a member of the party to be a lawyer. But the, even 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 more worrying is that you know there were very speech restrictive laws in the Weimar Republic. So someone like Adolf Hitler was banned from speaking in various mm. uh, Linda. And the, the German the the Nazis were very clever propagandists. So someone like like Goebbels, who later became propaganda minister, mm. started a, a newspaper called Der Angriff, and it was, uh, the, they, they had these uh, emergency laws which allowed the government to basically ban newspapers that spread fa uh, false information or attack the government. And Goebbels would then s say, well, you know, we are these martyrs of the government. My, yeah. my newspaper is closed down. Mm. And, but, and, and the most alarming thing, I think, of, of what I call the Weimar fallacy is that the Nazis, when they came into power, used the laws that were supposed to protect democracy to abolish uh, yeah. uh, democracy. So, so there was a Article 48 in the Weimar Constitution allowed the president to suspend all civil liberties, including free speech and association. And Hitler, after, after the Reichstag fire, uh, Hitler leaned on the president to, to, to use that president, and, and then they could legally ban social democrats, uh, mm. socialist newspapers, ban uh, political parties and establish a, a totalitarian one-party state. So in my, you know, and of course you can't explain uh, the cataclysm of, of, of uh, Nazism through the, the narrow lens of censorship and, and free speech. No. But many, many other and maybe more important factors were in play, but to me, it, it, the, the history of the Weimar Republic and Nazism doesn't support the idea that restricting free speech is an effective measure in combating totalitarian movements. All right. Um, and I love the saying that, you know, how do you promote free speech? You just have more of it. Uh, you just keep talking. 
do we have to accept with freedom of speech that people, and in some cases large numbers of people or vocal minorities of people, are going to say things that are just dumb, crazy and wrong and we strongly disagree with? And do we have to develop a tolerance for those? And I'm going to put it out there and I'll get lots of texts from angry people. Um, the conspiracy theories around COVID-19, which have huge currency uh, amongst a small group of very vocal uh, people in New Zealand. I get hundreds of emails a week saying, you should read this, you should watch this video, mm. and it's all the World Economic Forum and there's a global mm. conspiracy involving Bill Gates to depopulate the world. Yeah. Well, that's free speech. It's rubbish, but yeah. it's free speech. Yeah. How do we learn to tolerate that idiocy? Yeah, um, so I very much believe that ultimately free speech depends on, on, on culture, sort of a, a culture of, of, of acceptance of social dissent, basically seeing that free speech um, is the antithesis of violence. It's what allows us to discuss and debate and solve issues peacefully, whereas, you know, hundreds of years ago, we'd go to war over our political or religious or philosophical mm. uh, differences. And But we also have to accept that free speech comes with harms and costs. You know, free speech is an experiment. There's no one, you know, I for, for all my support of free speech, I cannot guarantee that free speech will not result in 50 years of some movement taking over power in New Zealand and establishing a totalitarian uh, state. That, you I know, think so. It's cheery. <laughs> but uh, what I can guarantee is that if that movement creates an authoritarian state in New Zealand, well, the first thing they will do is to shut down uh, free speech because every authoritarian mm. uh, government since the overthrow of the Athenian democracy uh, has viewed free speech uh, as the enemy of authoritarian uh, mm. rule. So, so I believe that we have to tolerate conspiracy theories. And I think we often, you know, we focus on quickly on the dark sides of free speech but we have actually more resilience I think um, mm. you know in exposing and uh, and debunking uh, conspiracy theories and there's you know there, there's gonna be a group of people that you can't convince no matter what mm. uh, uh, but that shouldn't be t taken as evidence that free speech and debate doesn't work because as long as it's sort of a fringe that, that suggests that access mm. to information, reliable information, traditional, um, robust journalism actually does work with the, with the critical mass of, uh, mm. of, of, of the population. So if you allow the fringe conspiracy theorists to be, if you say they are representative of the effects of free speech, I think you're missing out on the ah, huge benefits yeah, yeah. Of, of, of free speech. All right, that is a good point. And we probably do not in a world that enjoys negative headlines and very, very polarised uh, debate. We don't often um, see the benefit in saying, gosh, that's working well. There's nothing yeah, no, to see there, yeah. yeah no, and, and you know, you know, the, the fact that you and I, you, you know, you've said, uh, sort of hinted at, at, at criticism of your current government, that's your, you're exercising free speech right now. Yeah, yeah. But if you were living in Iran, uh, or even Russia, you know, yeah. someone be, be storming through the door right now. And well, you'd be, you'd I, guess, be... I guess the very real fear in New Zealand is that if we allow hate speech laws to progress, if we allow what seems to be, uh, as you've put it, and I think it's a great term, an elite panic uh, amongst our academics, if we allow that to take hold, there will be someone storming yeah. through the door. We already have examples of people who are self-styled journalists being excluded from visiting this country uh, and the Prime Minister claimed to me that that was all just immigration stuff and had to do with the criminal background. We mm. then find out that our security services were involved and our police were involved mm. as identifying this person as undesirable yeah. and then moving heaven and earth to exclude them from visiting New Zealand yeah. to cover a legitimate political protest. Yeah. No, but listen, uh, you know, I think in most democracies uh, where hate speech laws are, are, a, are a fact, you still have um, political pluralism, but, it, you know, you see some worrying things. So in Denmark, my, mm. uh, you know, my home country, for instance, um, Two people during COVID protests, now they were uh, admittedly part of, of, of this crazy conspiracy movements that were sort of mm. making a ruckus in the streets, but they 
had an effigy of our prime minister th uh, that was, mm. and, and there was this very inflammatory. Uh, oh, we, sign. we have had yeah. we have had people but, outside our parliament threatening to sure, burn but, it down and hold. But, but they were arrested for something like like yeah. treason. Uh, and then there was a woman who, protesting this arrest, put up the the picture of our prime minister burned in effigy on her Facebook, and the police came to her, uh, arrested her. Uh, and you know you have people in France uh, who are being fined for uh, showing the president Emmanuel Macron, who is a vital part of the Christchurch call, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, sh uh, depicted as a, as a Nazi. You know, and if you can't vocally yeah. criticize your your, yeah. your if the, you the, can't the leader, put a Hitler yeah. mustache on a on a campaign billboard of what? your president yeah. of the most yeah. powerful uh, person yeah. in in the country, that 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 seriously erodes. You know, in in mm. Germany, people being arrested for a, uh, a tweet calling, and I'm sorry to your listeners, uh, a local politician for a dick. Mm. You know, the police showing up at, at, at his you apartment. You get away with dick here, that's a free okay. pass. Um. <laughs> um, so, so, so I think there is this tendency that of, of what you might call scope creep, once you have um, yeah. free uh, hate speech laws, yeah. because more and more groups are going to say, well, if group A is being uh, protected, quote unquote, from why certain, why not I? And then you'll see these HB laws being weaponized as as various groups. You know, it could be the LGBT community going against um, socially conservatives. It could be, you know, uh, radical feminists versus uh, trans activists yeah. uh, and, and so on. That's a really interesting point you raise because the... The context for our hate speech laws is that they are there to protect certain vulnerable minorities. And if you're not a member of those, it would seem to me you don't get the protection. Mm. And that seems to me horribly undemocratic, horribly inequitable. Surely the protection from hateful speech should apply equally to all citizens yeah, in every way. It, it, in many ways, there are so many built-in contradictions, uh, and, and they, of course, tend to reflect current events and history. So in, 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 in Western Europe, hate speech law sort of is due to the fascist past. But if you go to former communist countries, they, they, they have said at the European Union, listen, if you want to criminalize the denial of the Holocaust, you know, we want to criminalize the denial of the crimes of Stalin. And the, the European Union said, no, we can't do that because th that's against... Uh, that's against free speech, but you know, what's in, in principle, you know, you know, why not? You know, yeah. Stalin killed millions of uh, yeah. uh, of people, and and again, it, th I think there's also this that like if you protect various groups, um, you also tend to sort of uh, define people as parts of, of groups rather than 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 as individuals. So, well, the know, narrative here is that if you're, uh, I guess, my age, a white, a male and of European descent, or what we call a Pākehā, you are a colonialist, mis uh, you're a colonialist woman-hating oppressor, and you don't deserve any protection. You are the enemy. And we live in a culture that is dominated by that narrative. Um, and it, I, I, I hate to say, and maybe it's from a personal perspective, it seems to me that hate speech laws are specifically designed not to protect people like that. Yeah, but the, the, the thing the thing is that once they're in place, so if if the current government you have in New Zealand has certain ideas about hate speech laws, they're being put in uh, to to uh, to place. Then when a new government comes in, it might have different ideas about who should be protected, and those who were in favour of mm. of of certain groups being protected might suddenly find that they have become the target rather than the beneficiary of hate speech laws. Mm. And 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 I'll give you an example from Denmark. So we had this cartoon affair where the, a Danish newspaper published cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, I'm and well aware, yeah. A, a, a huge uh, international crisis ensured. Uh, in, uh, yeah, it was, ensured, it was yeah. massive. And, and, a, and, a, and a lot of Muslim groups in Denmark said, well, that should be banned either as blasphemy or hate speech. And, right. and people on the right said, no, free speech is absolute. Then we had a center-right government come into power and suddenly uh, people on the right... Charlie were, Hebdo was... Uh, well, no, Charlie Hebdo was in France. France yeah, yeah, in, in Denmark, yeah, Denmark, Denmark right. yeah. And suddenly laws were being adopted targeting uh, indirectly, or I mean, Muslims. Yeah. So uh, Muslim imams and others sort of... And, and suddenly, you know, Muslim groups who had called for restrictions on free speech were, were suddenly finding that they themselves were being targeted for, uh, mm -hmm. by free speech restrictions. That's interesting in the context of the next question I wanted to ask you. Is there, from what you can see, a discernible difference between how uh, parties or political movements or supporters of the centre-left or the centre-right 
regard hate speech laws or freedom of speech? I, I think, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I think currently, I, and you know, I don't want to generalize, but th there's, there, there are certainly uh, on the, what you might call progressive left, this idea that free speech um, is a danger to minorities and equality. They see free speech and equality as at the extreme end, mutually exclusive, where my, my you know, I would argue that free speech and equality are mutually reinforcing. Uh, mm. uh, um, uh, but I, you know, I certainly would say that, uh, you know, if you look at the US, for instance, people on the right are certainly not principal free speech defenders. So many of those who are against, um, uh, you know, uh, critical race theory and so are very happy passing laws that restrict uh, mm. ideas of, of those on the left. And and, uh, and and I think that's one of the the built-in dangers is that very few people have a principled approach to free speech. There's always uh, this this but, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's what I call Milton's curse after John Milton because he was he was he, he was uh, he was in favor of press freedom, but not for but, Catholics. But, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> um, and I think you you mention a word that so sums this up, and is at the very core of free speech. It is a principle. And uh, our principle isn't negotiable and shouldn't be compromised. And I think we started out by saying it is a fundamental, perhaps the fundamental principle to have a functioning democracy, a functioning enlightened democracy. Um, and I think principle is, the principle of free speech is the thing that must be promoted and protected. Uh, at all times. You mentioned at the start too, and don't worry about the uh, hour, we, we, I'm allowed to delay the news because it's <laughs> my station, um, and I think we will, we'll keep talking. Um, so how do we as individuals, or collectively as societies, protect that principle? You said that, that free speech was perhaps in decline past its golden age. Can it be protected and saved? And how does the individual do that? Yeah, first of all, I think, um, as I said, free speech depends on a, on a, on a cultural commitment. So, mm. you, know, you know, even if the law on paper is very speech protective, if, if there's not an underlying commitment among a critical mass of citizens, it's mm. unlikely to be, uh, to be applied in a, in, a, in a robust speech protective manner. So I think ultimately it's up to us as, as citizens to come together to appreciate the value of free speech and appreciate the dangers of restricting, however tempting it might be to say, this group, now, this is so clearly beyond the pale, we need to restrict mm. that through, through, through laws. Um, and I think, you know, obviously I'll, I would say that having written a, a book on the history of free speech, so I think we can learn a lot, appreciate a lot from the history of free speech of, of how mm. societies have looked at speech and thought that was extremely dangerous, we have to restrict it, whereas today we'd say, wow, why, you know, why would you want to execute heretics? Uh, why, yeah. <laughs> what's so dangerous about blasphemy? And actually that is another comparison that I often make is that it's like we have witch hunts. We have a new era of pogroms and witch hunts and hate speech is used as the identifier to take out your political enemy, uh, damage them or de-platform de them, form them cancel. We live in a cancel culture and often it is the claim of hate speech against a minority group, sometimes completely spurious, which has, is used as the excuse to destroy someone's political career, professional career, to cancel someone, to oust them from society. So also it would seem to me hate speech can be weaponized strongly uh, for those who are not principled. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I want to distinguish between, you know, when it comes to cancel culture, I think, you know, if you believe in free speech, you know, uh, I have to accept that people attack me viciously online if they think I'm yeah, an idiot. I know if, the if, feeling, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so if people listen to this show and think, Jacob, you've just made a, a, yeah. an absolute ass of yourself, you know, yeah. that's, not, uh, that, that, that's not problematic. I have to suffer that. Yeah. Um, but if you, uh, if you, for instance, uh, say, well, a, uh, a university professor who wrote something on Facebook should be fired from their position. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's yeah. where I think... Can, can some, as Jordan Peterson would tell you, it can also be quite empowering. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, and, and of course, when, the, when, when laws come into the picture, that, that's, that, that, that's when it becomes uh, really problematic. Mm. A documentary last night that we had this uh, called The Web of Chaos, um, a government-funded documentary. Um, 
It had Steve Bannon quoting saying New Zealand is the canary down the down the mine shaft on issues like this. A small little country where uh, we, we we we've called ourselves in the past a social laboratory. Um, does what we do here in regards to freedom of speech or hate speech laws matter in an international context? I, th- I think it. I think it does. Um, you know, I'm not sure the, how much it, it. It probably matters more what the European Union, as a block of 27 mm, democracies, yeah. uh, does. But it would be great if New Zealand showed uh, a different path ahead that was that was more speech protective. You know, as a um, uh, as a diverse, open democracy, it could be you know it could be a, a shining beacon of of what can be achieved with with free speech of how people. Uh, of various ethnicities and so on can live together in peace based on on free speech rather than than trying to secure social peace through restrictions of uh, of free speech. Um, even though I think you know Steve Bannon is uh, he's probably one of those who is not very principled. No, no, about no, free he's speech. not. And I, I, I didn't. I, it wasn't an endorsement of Steve Bannon. It yeah. was interested that it was in this uh, documentary. Jacob, um, so nice talking to you. Thank you so much for for coming in. Um, and enjoy your visit to New Zealand. It's great that the Free Speech Union have got uh, you out there and continue your great work. Thank you very Thank much, you so much for your time. Um, that is uh, Jacob Michingama, who is here with the Free Speech Union from uh, Copenhagen, where he runs a think tank around freedom of speech.